Have you ever heard of under-collateralized loans in DeFi? Well, if you haven't already, we've got you covered. Let's find out what they are and some interesting ways DeFi is facilitating these loans. Are you ready to take a quick stroll in the streets of Mesopotamia, 3000 BC? All right, let's go. Now, before fiat currency was widely used, ancient people used food as a way to pay their debts. So basically, farmers would borrow seeds and then share their harvests to pay their debts. But how did ancient lenders trust debtors without any security? Well, according to Babylonian law, defaulters had to sell themselves and their families for money or do forced labor for up to three years. I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? Imagine putting up your wife or your husband or your children as a collateral for a loan. Okay, let's go back to the 21st century. Well, systems for taking out loans are definitely better, but there's still some flaws. So say I wanna take out a loan to start a new coffee shop. Well, I'll need to possess a credit score, I have sufficient assets, or a source of income to even be considered by the bank's credit assessors. Decentralized lending and borrowing attempt to remove as many of these barriers as possible, allowing anyone, anywhere to secure loans on platforms such as Aave or Maker. Now the catch of course being users need to over collateralize their lending positions. Now, this system of lending has allowed crypto enthusiasts to access immediate consumption without selling off their positions. Okay, so let's go back to that coffee shop business, for example. Say it's almost Christmas and we need some holiday themed cups to go with our Christmas decorations. And I happen to hold some Bitcoin, which at the time is doing really well. Well, instead of selling our Bitcoin, I deposit it on Aave take out a loan on USDT to buy the holiday themed cups. Well, as great as that may sound, the use case is still limited to people who have access to some funds, and in this case, crypto. So what if I don't have the money to begin with? What do I do then? Well, that is where under collateralized loans come in. So as the name suggests, an under collateralized loan is any loan that is not fully or at all collateralized. That is to say, should the loan default, the collateral, if any, will not be able to cover the principal. Okay, now that we have an idea of what an under collateralized loan is, we can look into its different methods. So the market of under collateralized lending can be segmented into eight different types, but in this video, I'll just focus on the three most popular ones, which are flash loans, third party risk assessment, and crypto native credit scores. All right, let's begin. Blink and you might miss it. That's flash loans for you. They are uncollateralized loans where borrowing and repayment must both occur within the same transaction. So this means that risk is minimized for both parties since borrowing and repayment will have to happen simultaneously for the transaction to be processed. And in case of deviation, the transaction is reversed. Now, due to its structure, flash loans are pretty popular with arbitrageurs looking to quickly capitalize on the price difference between two platforms. Now, as innovative as flash loans are, they are designed for very niche purposes with no application in conventional loans or just serving the average borrower. So onto a solution that's useful to the average borrower, third-party risk assessment. This model introduces a third group outside of lenders and borrowers to perform the role of credit assessment. Now, remember that all of this happens on chain. Therefore, users who want to act as credit assessors have to stake a certain amount of tokens to qualify. And in the case of a default, the collateral that they staked will be first in line to be slashed. But on the flip side, they get rewarded for successful loan repayments. Now this sets up a reasonable incentive structure that achieves what the solution is precisely after, under collateralization. In the process, it paves the way for an on-chain credit scoring system. Now the key challenge with this structure is bootstrapping a network of capable credit assessors with an appropriate level of borrower data. And not only that, but introducing human level checks also comes with human errors 
and time-consuming processes. However, overlooking these drawbacks, borrowers get to access funds without collateralizing any assets. And of course, the bigger picture of borrowers being able to build up their on-chain credit scores and trustworthiness, which should facilitate future on-chain lending and borrowing even on other protocols. Protocols such as Goldfinch and Maple Finance use this model, and if done properly, it will successfully open crypto lending to the majority of the world. All right, let's turn our attention to crypto native credit scores. So this type of under collateralized loan aims to leverage the user's history on the blockchain to determine their repayment abilities. It's kind of similar to how traditional banks use credit history to assess loan applications. So. For instance, a DeFi protocol may look into a user's historical on-chain activity ranging from loan repayment, yield farming, or trading activity, and this information could be used to construct a crypto credit profile. Now, this profile is ideally unique to the wallet address and can potentially be used across multiple platforms to help facilitate loan assessments. However, there are loopholes in this model. For starters, the pseudonymity of wallets also means that if a user were to default on a loan, he or she could just switch to another wallet to apply for another loan. So one of the solutions that's commonly brought up for this problem is to connect real world IDs on chain with a single wallet. But this is kind of against the spirit of decentralization championed by DeFi. So one way to get around this is to introduce zero knowledge proof of off-chain data. So this is an encryption scheme whereby one party can prove the truth of specific information to another party without disclosing any additional information. And this makes customers comfortable enough to share their real world IDs on chain and tie them to a single wallet in a pseudonymous way. Now, there are a number of projects already working on this with some such as Wing Finance and EasyFi running their own lending protocols as well. And if successful, this approach will allow lending platforms to properly curate and assess a large trove of on-chain profiles. All right, to finalize this video, I'll briefly mention other methods of under collateralized loans. Okay, so first off-chain credit integration. This is a solution that looks to import off-chain data such as credit scores to support assessment of under collateralized loans. Second, there's personal network bootstrap, a solution that makes borrowing invite only by allowing lenders to control the borrower pool. Third is real world asset loans. Users can use real world assets as collateral for crypto loans. And these assets are represented on chain as NFTs. Finally, fourth, we have NFTs as collateral, that is NFT back loans, which also enable improved liquidity for NFTs. Well, we're living in the early days of under collateralized loans and it may one day be at the center of DeFi. All in all, only mainstream DeFi adoption can help it go toe to toe and even overcome traditional banking services in one of the oldest human practices, lending money. Well, do you believe under collateralized loans will fuel mainstream adoption of DeFi? Well, let us know in the comments. Remember to like, subscribe and follow us on all our socials if you want to stay updated to all things crypto. Bye.